And that was only in 1984. The point being is, is we were getting 9% overnight. So my partner and I, we sat there and said, you know, we could take three quarters of a million dollars. We could invest that 9% and we'll make another five, almost $6,000 a month by just moving it. And it still counts towards reserve. So I called Brinks up as any normal person would do. And um, they said, we can come up a week from Thursday. It's going to cost $250. And I said, I'll call you back. And I went in his office and said, I'm not paying $250. And Raj, we literally loaded three quarters of a million dollars in the trunk of a 1989 Buick. And I drove to St. Louis. We slept with it. And the next morning, got up and took it to the Fed. This is Country Club Conversations. I'm Raj Tut, founder and CEO of Storyboard Living. This show gives you actionable insights from the hard to reach top percentile in business and entrepreneurship. I think everyone deserves this type of access and I'm bringing it to you. Welcome to the club. Sean, thank you for being on the show. Oh, Raj, I'm so excited to be on your show. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to see what all the things you have going. What a great company you have. And uh, I'd like to interview you actually. Maybe we could do that next time. Uh, <laughs> I'll take you up on that. I do appreciate your time today. So you are an entrepreneur, author, felon, speaker. Uh, your book, The Great Choice, is an excellent read. I read it in two days because I was truly captivated by the way you put together your life story. And your story is one worth telling. I think it's extremely interesting. You've seen the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. You were a lifelong entrepreneur. You did everything from fireworks to banking and in between some gambling, real estate, hotels, restaurants, et cetera. You were the co-founder, CEO of Allegiant Bank Corp. At one point, one of the largest publicly traded bank holding companies. You grew that bank from a little bank in Northeast Missouri to one that had over $2 billion in holdings and eventually sold it for $500 million. So an incredible story. Uh, before we get to that, I'd really like to learn a little more about how you grew up. You grew up in Thayer, Missouri, a town of less than 2,000. What was that like for you? How did that kind of shape who you eventually became? You know, there's, I tell people, one, the Midwest is a great place to grow up. But to grow up in a town of a couple thousand people is such an experience because you know everyone or you know someone who knows someone. And um, I remember in the, in the 70s when I was a child, Graffiti was a big thing around the world, but you never saw that in a small town because you knew the people's wall that someone would write on. So it gave you a sense of community, a, a, a sense of, of place. I don't watch TV, but I know there was a show. And in a small town, on, in the fall, it's football on Friday nights. In the winter, it's basketball. And in the spring and the summer, it's baseball. It's a real sense of community. So it was a wonderful, I wouldn't trade where I grew up for anything. The problem is that I talked to a lot of people that I grew up with and other people I've met through my journey in life who grew up in small towns, it's just hard to make a really good living because there's just not the economic opportunity. When you say really good living, I did read in your book that you were really driven to become a millionaire. And just for context for some of the viewers or listeners, back then that would have been maybe 10 times what being a millionaire is today. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, it's funny you say that because my one cousin on my mother's side, and uh, his grandfather and my grandfather were brothers, and his grandfather died, and he had $300,000. And of course, I Googled that, be a million nine. And in a town of 2,000 people, with you have brothers that each have $300,000 a lifetime ago. So you have to put perspective. So yeah, a million dollars isn't what it was. There's a lot more millionaires than there were in those days. When you got involved with entrepreneurship, the first business you were involved with was selling fireworks, correct? Yeah. The people don't realize this, but in a small town, there's nothing. And our science teacher, who actually quit teaching after my sophomore year, bought a satellite company, ended up becoming a multimillionaire in the cell phone tower business. But he showed us four, and I've never told anyone this, four films that were about an hour long that year. And William Shatner, who was starving to death at that time in life, described what an entrepreneur was. I'd never heard that word. I went all the way through undergraduate business school, entrepreneurship was not mentioned. To me, entrepreneurship is a child of the late 80s till today, and I love it. And that's really what makes this country great is you can come here and start with little, and if you, you, know, if you work hard and um, you can do very well. You're an example of that. That's why I say sometimes I am going to interview you. But uh, I was um, looking for a job in the summer of 80, 
And my dad said, what are you going to do? I was working at my cousin that I spoke of earlier, his wife's gift store. And he said, one, you're not making any money. I said, two, but I'm meeting a lot of cute gals. And he said, that isn't going to, going to cut it. And so literally, Raj, to make a long story short, I talked a fireworks company in Little Rock, Arkansas, into giving me $20,000 worth of fireworks on consignment. I worked three weeks, had a great suntan, read a lot of books, and made $20,000. And in 1980, that would be like 100000 And for a college kid, that was, uh, that was a start. And so uh, it's the most wonderful thing in the world that you can have an idea and watch it come to fruition. Yeah, I, I equally share that kind of uh, passion for entrepreneurship, and that's partly why, or the main reason why I'm in this country. I think if you want to reach your potential as an entrepreneur, you need to be in the U.S. Uh, that's my opinion, at least. I find it interesting that as someone who, from such an early age, was so, I guess, interested in or just taken over by entrepreneurship, you decided to go into one of the more conservative professions, which is banking. How did you end up with your first banking gig and why did you decide to go into banking? Oh, and that's interesting you say that because my parents who gave me little guidance, they were both a greatest generation, World War II, and um, basically you do anything you want to do, but don't be a banker. I had a college professor who was just, he was crazy. He was like uh, in Back to the Future, the the professor guy, his hair kind of stuck up and and um, I had him in, in economics one, and then as a senior, I had him in money and banking two. And he and you had three preferential interviews. And he said, "You should interview with the bank." And I said, "Why?" And he goes, "The world is changing." And that forty years ago was the beginning of the evolution. It's also the beginning of the decline, the end of banking. And I talk about that early in the book. How now it's going to Chick Fil A or McDonald's, and it's a whole different thing. But I got in at the right time, and my dad had a partner who was unbelievably successful. And he actually had two. The other one, there's a funny Sam Walton story that sometime we're not on the air, I'll tell you about uh, people who come to me business plans and choosing not to go on board. And uh, he had a chance to be with Sam Walton. But the other one said, Sean, he goes, you're going to learn, if nothing else, how to borrow money. That was half of it. The other half of it was I came to St. Louis, which you came here as an outsider. And most people say it's a very tough town and it's very parochial. It's a wonderful thing. It has a small town feel to it. There's a lot of great things, but it's harder on locals than it is on those of us who come from the outside because they can't put us in a box. And so I came here and I literally have been thrown out of every door in St. Louis. I jokingly say, but I knew Chuck Knight, August Bush III at one end. At the other end, the second bank I bought was at Grand in West Florissant, which when I went there was the highest crime rate since its track in the city of St. Louis. So I've had the privilege, and I call it a privilege, of meeting people from both ends of the spectrum. And I grew up where race didn't matter, age didn't matter, because when you're a small town, everyone's equal. You don't understand what money is because there's, there's not a huge discrepancy like you can see in a metropolitan area. You didn't have TV in those days that glorified so many things that that I think it make it hard for people to get beyond. And so I came here and I was just a guy from Thayer and they couldn't say, oh, you're from that parish or, oh, you went to that school because they're very quickly to say, oh, then they make a social judgment. With someone from out of town, they can't. And that's what made my career successful. That's a great point. I also think that outsiders kind of see St. Louis for what it can be versus what it was. I find that Sometimes, not always, locals are a little more pessimistic about the region than outsiders. I think it's one of America's uncovered gems that just has a ton of potential. Would you agree that St. Louis today is still, number one, a great place to be, and then also just has a ton of potential to be like a Nashville, Austin? Absolutely. But the strange part, you just said something unique. My sister and her husband went to Nashville 55 years ago. And he told me, not knowing I was going to be in St. Louis because I was in, in school, in high school, he said, Nashville will pass St. Louis. And now we have to have that attitude, we'll pass Nashville. And I agree, outsiders see what it can be. And it's a wonderful place. The other thing is, there's 160 million people not that far away. And I dealt a lot in New York, and I have I always had family, and I still have two sons in L.A., and we're flyover. You know, we're west of the Appalachians and east of the, of the Rockies to most people. But this is really where it is. And especially when you look at bio, you know, this agra and bio opportunities and things. So, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity here. And it, it'll do well in the future because 
of all the things that made it what it should have been. But some people, as always, leaders can make some foolish decisions and choose not to lead. And this area lost a lot of time for that. That potential that the city has had for so long and hasn't really capitalized on, is that the same kind of potential that you saw when you first came to St. Louis? I did. I also, I spent uh, almost two years in Kansas City. And as I say, the arch belongs in Kansas City because it's really the gateway to the West. St. Louisans used to think they were Easterners and they're not even the right time zone. But, you know, there, it had all those things and, uh, you know, it has, it's pretty, the economy is very diverse. It has, you know, you have health care. Have, we have a great financial community here. People don't realize that other than New York, we're like number two in financial firms. You have manufacturing, you have government. And it, it has one of those things with, that gives it that. The other thing is um, my wife was with, at the time, the largest law firm in the state of Missouri. I don't know anymore. But they did work all over the world because you could pay a lawyer here $250 an hour and get the same quality work you get in New York City for eight fifty, dollars or in London for, you know, for seven fifty. And in business to see that, we all know now business is, I learned this almost 40 years ago, business is seven twenty four. It's global. And, and smart people say, where can I outsource resource and, uh, and run my company more efficiently? And that's the thing we offer here. So it sounds like you are always thinking about efficiency, the way you mentioned outsourcing and just the global environment of business today. Were you thinking the same way when you bought your first bank? Well, I, and in the book, I tell the story about the million one hundred thousand dollars in cash in the vault. And for you listeners, in those days, banks would have millions of dollars of cash. You don't earn interest on that. It counts towards your reserve requirements. But if you send it to the Fed, you can get interest every night. In those days, rates, people think rates are high now. I like to say, and I'm going to ask you this question before I finish my story. What was your first home mortgage? What rate? Uh, 3%. And mine was 12 and a half. And mine was a one-year arm, and I was glad to get it. And that was only in 1984. The point being is, is we were getting 9% overnight. So my partner and I, we sat there and said, you know, we could take three quarters of a million dollars. We can invest that 9%, and we'll make another five, almost $6,000 a month by just moving it, and it still counts towards reserves. So I called Brinks up, as any normal person would do, and um, they said, we can come up a week from Thursday. It's going to cost $250. And I said, I'll call you back. And I went into his office and said, I'm not paying $250. And Raj, we literally loaded three-quarters of a million dollars in the trunk of a 1989 Buick, and I drove to St. Louis. We slept with it, and the next morning got up and took it to the Fed. So efficiencies were important. I sold out to a Fortune 200. And um, when we got down to the end of due diligence, I'd bought many companies in my life. And I was, you know, you always went for that swipe. Once you had a deal, then you tried to cut the price just a little. You're in the, in the apartment business. You sign the contract. You do your due diligence. And you like to go back and say, you know, this and this weren't quite what I thought they were. Will you take 5% less? And that's what I was expecting. And uh, we went to dinner and I actually got, another 50 cents a share out of them, which was about $9 million, which was nice. But the second thing is their only criticism was your branches, and we had 38 of them, need a little sprucing up. What they didn't realize, and, and you're, again, you're an apartment guy, you understand flooring, we went to buy carpet, and we bought a trailer truck load of seaweed green. Well, first off, you know why we bought it was no one wanted seaweed green. And the second thing is we live in a generation now where people buy carpet by the square foot. So we paid 12 and a half cents a square foot or a dollar a square yard in those days. And what was funny is, is people were like, you guys are crazy. And we were, but we were efficient because i have been taught in business school and I've watched it in business. He with the low cost at the end of the day can make a lot of mistakes and still win. But if you've got high cost, you can't make as many mistakes. And we made a lot of mistakes. It sounds like speed and execution were the two things that you were focused on as you were growing that first bank or that first large business. Can you kind of go back to how that opportunity came up for you to buy a bank and how you were able to execute on it? Because for someone like me coming from Canada, a country that realistically only has four banks, buying a bank is unheard of. So how did that opportunity kind of fall in your lap? And that's a really good question. No one asked me that. When I got out of school, there were over 21,000 banks in the country. Today, there's about 5,000, and we won't ever get to Canada or the UK, but we'll get to 1,000 or something like that. But banking, and I didn't realize this, but it was very entrepreneurial outside of, you know, the big 25 or whatever. 
And I worked for a, one of the hundred largest banks in the days of 21,000. And what was interesting, we finance people like yourself buying banks all the time. So I understood how they finance, how people bought them. And a man brought me an opportunity when Commerce Bank, which is a very well-run, excellent company based here in St. Louis, was divesting of four outstate banks. And this guy wanted one. To get the one he wanted, he had to buy the less desirable one as well, which he sold us. And um, we paid him $3.3 million. And it was, it was 89 and the, you know, the country was getting ready to go into recession. And uh, what's now U.S. Bank was gracious enough to lend us $750,000. And then I spent the summer of 1989, I raised $2,659,000 from 83 people whom I knew less than five years. That's back to the entrepreneurial spirit in this country. And those people, if you put up $25,000 for getting dividends, they got back a quarter million. So they did real well on a 14-year investment. But the point was, you hit the nail on the head. And that's why our branches didn't matter. People wanted speed and decision-making and execution. And so we gave them really good service. And I always say, small companies can be 10% planning, 10% process. And if you're 80% execution, you're going to win every day. Big companies are usually a third planning, a third process, a third execution. They're an aircraft carrier in the Mississippi. They're going nowhere in a hurry, but they do it well. A little guy, if you can execute, you can win. And so we focused on execution and we had so much fun. You know, there's just crazy stories of things we did. You know, a guy called me up from a cruise ship at home one Sunday and said, Sean, there's a house my wife and I want to buy in a, in a really nice suburb of St. Louis. And he said, but I, I need to have it done tomorrow. And I said, okay, Lee, I'm going to charge you a $5,000 fee over and above because you called me at home on the weekend and you got your deal. No problem. There was a guy in town that had $46 million in treasury notes. He saw a house on Friday. He wanted to close on Monday. And um, he wanted a mortgage on it because that, the interest was tax deductible. And um, no, he banked in a very large bank. And they said, we can't do that. Execution. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, his stockbroker from Merrill Lynch showed up at my house. And uh, two martinis later, we closed Monday afternoon. And it was a real mortgage loan. So he qualified for the interest deduction. So little things make a big difference. And I believe we live in a world today where execution is easier because information can travel so much faster. Communication is instantaneously. And so I think people in business have such an advantage if they focus on execution and using speed to be their friend, not their foe. I love um, the focus on execution, but I'd like to go back a little bit to the 3.3. So when we're looking at an apartment deal, for example, we have a methodology of how we're coming up with the pricing, whether it's based on current income, where we think we can take the income, maybe replacement costs, things like that. And by the way, we've actually never retraded. And we've made it a point to do that because I'm trying to build a reputation of where sellers want to come to us for ease of transaction. So we're kind of building our brand in a different manner because there's the repeat sellers. And also there is such a small community in St. Louis to where I think word will travel fast because we're only in St. Louis. If we were in all of the Midwest, it'd be a different story. So that 3.3 million, how do you come up or how did you come up with that value? I have no clue how someone would value a bank. And banks, and, um, and this will give you an idea, banks, you know, you have assets minus liabilities. Your net worth is your book value. In banks traded sometimes at discount to book value, I actually sold for 3.35 times book value, 23 and a half times forward earnings, one of the highest prices. But in recessionary periods like now, not so much recessionary periods, a lot of uncertainty, banks generally trade around book value unless they have some real niches they might trade twice at. But we bought it for 110% of book value. And what it really meant was he had to pay 3 million and he wanted, and it took us from the time he closed until we closed was about 10 months. And at 12%, that was about 10%. And so he got 110% of book. I sold that same bank nine years later, not selling any capital, only selling the deposits and the loans for 3 million. So I, nine years, sucked a ton of earnings out of it and got my money back. But um, like in anything, apartments trade, say they trade for so much a unit. When times are good, they're higher per unit. When times are low, they're better. You said something a while ago that is so true and you're young and I'm so glad you understand this and I'll, but I'll rephrase it. All businesses, meaning all markets are very small. You may think you're only in St. Louis, but I guarantee you there's somebody in Indianapolis and somebody in Kansas city who know about you and are watching you. 
because the people who do really well, they know what their competitors are doing and they understand them because that's important. They may never directly compete, but they can learn from you just like you can. As we talked before your show, I said my best trait is I've been a really good plagiarist because having had five children, my number two son would always push the envelope in, in a good way. And I would say, Brooks, there's no new idea in the last 10,000 years. It's just renamed in some new fashion. And the things you guys are doing are just over the top. To me, you're out there. You're not a plagiarist. You're on the forefront. So you're going to have a lot of your competition watching everything you do. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Just kind of expanding on that competition piece. So when you bought that first bank, it was in a town of uh, less than 3,000. And I believe you said in your book that there were four other banks in town. So how do you as an outsider go into that type of environment at a time when banking was primarily all relationships compared to today where you kind of compared it more to like a Chick-fil-A or a fast food service? Uh, what was your strategy there to be able to break into that town and build the relationships needed to grow the bank? Well, it was, we had a twofold strategy. First of all, we were the largest bank in town and that helped. Size matters. And, um, and secondly, our focus was in St. Louis. And I literally would drive 168 miles one way to work a lot of days and back that night. And uh, we used that as a way to come to St. Louis and um, closed in October. In um, January, I looked at a bank in St. Louis. By April or May, I had a contract and closed in August again. So it's really just most people, and you see this in the apartment world, they start from scratch, you build a new project, and you lose money. You can't, you know, you have to, you can't not. I, there were six banks that started in St. Louis the year before, and all six of them were startups. And I had all kinds of people come to me as, and cause I had been, I was in a great position where I was. And they said, why don't you start a bank? And I just couldn't do that Raj, because you lose money for the first year, the second year, maybe break even the third year. And literally we paid a 10% premium to make money day one. So our first year after tax, we made $360,000 on that $2,600,000. So we made what's at about a 14% return to our investors where our peers, if they'd raised the same money, they would have. And the other thing is when you start a bank, you can't borrow money. When you buy a bank, you can borrow money. So we have to introduce leverage and you're in a business where managing leverage is important. And literally in those days, I can show you where you could lever a bank 42 to one, which, you know, would be the out there, but a lever in one, three or five or 10 to one is pretty easy. And um, so we had those advantages that other people, we were making money day one. Now, we also inherited some problems because when you buy somebody else's business, you have some challenges. And um, I'll never forget, I went out, we had a loan, about a $9,800 loan. It was allegedly on a house. I thought it was on a house. So I pulled up and I went to this property, it had a gate, and I saw smoke coming out of the ground. And I walked up and literally this person had an underground dwelling without plumbing and without water and uh, that's when we changed the rules. If it was under 15,000, it was a place and not a house. But those aren't the kind of loans you would have made, but, you're here, but the person paid us, they were happy. There's some cultural differences, again, urban versus rural. But, but no, I, I would tell you those were fun years because we had the advantage of doing business in St. Louis because we'd gone through the, the, what, there'd been a recession, we didn't have problems. So we were out there making loans when other people were playing defense. And that's a lot of fun when you're always in a different position than your competitor. So it's fair to say then that the timing of when you entered banking or as an entrepreneur helped with your growth? Absolutely. And um, I had some really bright people around me, and I talk about this a lot in life. Uh, I had four people that I met with at least three or four times a month that were shareholders, but they were non-bankers. And they would ask me, why do we do something? And I know you do this. I can see just in my little experience with you, I can see your cultures like this as well. If I ever said we did it because that's the way we always did it, we usually ended up changing it. And I think that's wonderful because we talked before your show about complacency and people get complacent and complacency doesn't drive results. And over time, it really doesn't even drive survival because there's a point where after the law of diminished returns sets in for so long, you know, you're underwater and forget underperforming. And so they pushed me in that regard. The other thing is I had a woman in the group who had been an HR director for Mark Twain Banks. And um, we eventually passed. It was a great company, a lot of history, and a very entrepreneurial company that started in the 60s. And she would interview key people that everyone who reported to me, the people who interacted with me. And this is what she taught me, Raj. And this is my lesson 
for you today and for your listeners. She said, first thing she taught me was, Sean, leopards don't change their spots and tigers don't change their stripes. Everybody can change a little bit. Maybe it's 5%, the best can change 10. But in a lot of relationships, and I'll use a personal analogy, people get into them and they think they can change their partner. Well, maybe a little, but not a lot. That leads to failures. So that was her first lesson. Her second lesson was, Sean, she'd come in and say, this guy Raj is bright. You're going to love working with him. You're going to get great results. You're not going to like these two or three things. And she would say, you have to deal with those. You can't change him. Remember the leopards and, and tigers. You have to adjust yourself. Let him be who he is. Let him do that. Let him absorb our culture. And we'll come back to culture in a second. But you can't change him. So she taught me to suppress my will. And so many managers, owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs, they try to always push their will. Well, that can work in short periods of time. But when you're, we, we had a 15-year horizon, you have to be the one as the chief culture carrier. That, to me, is what a CEO is. You're the one who exudes a culture of what you want. And that's what, from the first time I met you, from I looked at your material, when I toured your facility today, you have a culture that this is what I know is making you successful, making you more successful. Because I've been in many of your competitors, their facilities, their offices, they don't have that. It's about culture. And so our culture was, Raj is going to come here, Raj is going to set the world on fire, but I have to be the one to absorb the change. Because you can't change everybody, so you have to work on changing yourself when you deal with individuals. And that piece of advice has made me tens of millions of dollars, and I encourage people to look at the world that way. It sounds like the culture piece and the execution piece were the two biggest that led to the growth you had. And I believe the growth was 11 million in holdings to two and a half billion in holdings, somewhere around there. When would you say that you started to really truly move into that CEO role or this chief culture officer role? Because at the beginning, you're driving, or at least once, maybe more than once, you drove 168 miles with $750,000 in your trunk. You were making decisions along with your partner or with other people in the company on the flooring in the carpet and the branches. So when did you start to truly move away from that entrepreneurial scrappy attitude of I'm going to do whatever I need to do to push this forward to I'm the CEO, I need to think about higher leverage activities in order to keep growing? It was about eight years in, about halfway in our terms, it was about a half a billion in assets because we literally, I told you the bank, the six banks that started the year before, today, none of them are that size. And in fact, 18 years ago, a group of my people left and started a bank with a man I mentioned from your world earlier. And 18 years later, it's still a third of our size in what we did in 10. And because I was able, and it was because I had those four people around me, to step back and say, it's time to be CEO. It's time to exude the culture. And my wife, who was with this large law firm, came out one night to pick me up at like six o'clock or something. And she walked into the building because I don't know if she was ever there more than twice. And she said, my gosh, there's people everywhere, salaried people. And I said, yeah, it's our culture. And she had many friends whose husbands work for large institutions. She goes, and her best friend's husband, David, well, you know, David doesn't drag into about 8.30 and by 4.30, he's in a bar with his buddies. And I'm looking at it because she knew they were counterparts, competitors, and they're in here. And I said, and they're salaried. It's a culture. The culture is we're going to do the right thing for our customer. I um, was a speaker a few months ago in an event. And um, the speaker before me was a tech guy and uh, he had done Microsoft and he'd done Apple. And this was, a, we both spoke to a group of 30 retired CEOs who are now directors and people pay them money for their knowledge. And that's a wonderful thing. And so he was there and he said, I spent a day at Microsoft and the entire day they asked me about Apple. He said, I spent a day at Apple and the entire day they asked me about their customer. What I see so many companies fail or underperform is they're focused on their competitor when your focus has to be on your customer. I could tell by the little things. When I walked in your office today, you're focused on your tenant. They're your customer. And that's how you win. Because there's always going to be somebody who's bigger, somebody who's faster, smarter, stronger, wealthier, all those things. But if you're focused on the customer, you're going to win so many more times than the others. And that's what happens because I, I used to bank eight plastic companies in St. Louis. And of course, I never shared information. They all knew, you know, that so-and-so banked with the same bank. And 
it was interesting because you'd be at lunch or something and they'd say, you know, so-and-so, this is the year they're going to go out of business. And I'm thinking, this is they're having their best year ever. They were so focused on the negatives in their competitor that they weren't thinking about the customer. Why was the customer going to them? That's what they should have been focused on. What was the customer's needs? And that's the best part of business. Know your customer. So we focused on our customer. And you're right. They wanted speed of delivery. We were convenient, but I, if I would have built those banks, they would look like Northern Trust. They would have had marble floors and unbelievable hardwoods and fireplaces. And our customers thanked in closed Hardee's and closed Kentucky Fried Chickens because they wanted the execution. When you mentioned your customer at that time, would you say your customer was, you know, the company trying to borrow millions of dollars for expansion? Uh, was it the person that has 10,000 in savings with you or was it the shareholders? Who would you classify as your customer? My customers were the little old lady with $10,000 and the businessman or woman who wanted to grow their business because you have to match assets and liabilities. So we had to be one thing to this one and one thing to this to this one. And that's the 38 locations were to the little old lady because that little old lady was how could she get that extra quarter percent? Well, I could give her that extra quarter percent in the beginning for one reason is I had low cost. So if you don't have all those expenses, you can pay a little more for your money. It's no deal you know, at a restaurant, you have, you have labor, food, and other expense. And, you know, if you're pizza, you have less food costs and less labor. So you, you know, you have margin that way. If you're a white tablecloth, you have high food costs, high labor, you better be getting in the revenue place. So you have to understand where you get it from. For the business owner, they wanted decisive speed and that's where we made our money. And we were never bashful about charging for price. You know, I have to tell you a story about an apartment guy. It's 1991. You were not born yet, but I have to teach you. I know you're a little older than that. April of 1991. <laughs> April. Okay. This, this was about April of 91. There was a guy in Kansas City who had 10,000 units, and which is a lot of apartments, as you know. He had bought phase three of apartment complex, which is beautiful, built at 87, four years old. He bought phase two, which is built in 81, which was really nice, but, you know, dated 10 years. And he needed to buy phase one built in 71 because to get to phase two and three, you had to drive through phase one. And phase one in 71 looked like it was 1971. So banks didn't lend money. And he needed a little over $2 million to buy these apartments. And he had the money to retrofit them. And so he won the money. So we gave him the money. We charged him 20 points, Raj. Okay, number one, 500000 on a two and a half million dollar loan. Number two, we got Prime Plus One tax free because they were tied to an industrial revenue project, Prime. So our, our yield was like 14% for getting the points. And he and his wife not only personally guaranteed it, they put a half a million dollar treasury note up behind their guarantee. That's how hard financing was. But the point was, he got what he needed and it changed and he paid us off in like two years and he came back and I gave him part of the feedback because we have to accrete it in over life loan anyway and take it in income. But the point was it changed his business. And he knew then what I'd learned 10 years before from my dad's partner one night when we were talking, a man who taught me a lot. And I said, isn't it terrible that interest rates are in the, you know, 20%? And he goes, shot it's irrelevant. What are you going to do with the money? That man knew the cost of the money, what it he had to have the money because he changed 500 units by changing 100. He changed his whole paradigm, the entrance to his property, everything he did. And so I always challenge people, it isn't always the cost of the money. It's, and you said relationships, and they're very hard to get in these days, but it's the relationship, it's the opportunity, it's what am I going to do with it? Because you can't be overly focused. It's important to, to look at the big picture. That's an incredible story. At that number of units back then, and for someone to have the conviction in their plan to borrow under the circumstances, I think uh, tells you a lot about the borrower, but also a lot about the bank that's willing to do that type of deal and understands the greater vision, which I think is a strength of you know the U.S. banking system with community banks that can truly understand the types of deals that they're getting into. This episode is brought to you by Storyboard Living. We're actively buying apartment communities in the St. Louis region, Southern Illinois, and Southern Missouri. We make transactions easy, and we've never gone under contract on an acquisition that we didn't close. We also offer a finder's fee and broker's bonus for off-market deals. If you have a property that may be a good fit for us, 
email deals at storyboardliving.com. That's deals at storyboardliving.com. What was the most interesting loan that you did as you were growing Allegiant? Because, you know, that loan there is very interesting to me because I'm an apartment guy. But do you have one that kind of stood out to you, like um, just in terms of one that was maybe extremely risky or just interesting business that you've never thought of? I can tell you about businesses. We had a woman, and this is the most, I want to tell you a little bit really quickly, that if you went to an insurance agent and you need to buy insurance, she did premium finance. She was making a half million dollars a year from her swimming pool. And I knew her husband and he said, Marcia needs money. And I took a young banger with me and, and she literally was, you know, was a very attractive woman in her pool in a swimming suit. And we cut a deal to lend her money and she financed premiums from her house with a telephone 25 years ago. And she just made money hand over. Now that business is consolidated. The insurance companies figured out, we well, yeah, if we get 25% down, we should finance it. And they ended up, but, but in those days, there was disintermediation. That's why I say information's, I think the most interesting loan was a manufacturing company in my father-in-law's union. And I think unions have a place, like I said earlier, to me, the world is green. Where's the economic opportunity? And this man came in, they'd been in business about 40 years. They made a huge electrical generators. And um, he said, we are losing, you know, they're breaking even here. We're losing the battle to General Electric and people like that because our labor costs are so out of line. And he said, it's not what we pay our workers. It's that they can only do one job. And he said, when we're slow, we don't want that person to not come to work. We want to be able to sweep a floor to move something. But the union rules where he said, this is not about a union. This is not about salaries. It's about changing rules. Because with the rules, if I can have the rule change, I'll become more efficient. And he said, I need $3 million to fight the union. And that was a difficult thing to wrestle with. Because you had to make sure, it, not only underwriting can he survive it, which I want to get to that in a minute, but you're dealing with people's lives on both sides and you don't want to think you're God and I'm not anti-union. I'm not anti-anything. And um, after a lot of deliberation, we said, we're going to do it. And it took him nine months. It changed his company. It changed the workforce. They went from being a class system of I'm a this and I'm a that and you're that to we're all in this together. They got really good wages because they weren't in St. Louis. They were happy. His productivity went up like threefold. It all dropped to the bottom line. They were healthier and um, he's now deceased. But every time I see him after that, he would go, Sean, you don't know what you guys did. You saved us in hundreds of jobs. So that was probably the most unique. I have to tell you this, you're in St. Louis and this man just passed away. He's a really good friend, Drury Hotels. And I was a young banker at UMB and I was at third person in um, stature in St. Louis. And um, I was in my office one day and the reception said, Sean, can you see Charles Drury, the founder of Drury Hotels? And I said, well, of course, but, you know, I don't know why, but he came in and he said, the chairman doesn't have time for me, the president. I applied for a house loan. And it was a quarter million dollars, which 37 years ago was a lot of money. I know right where the house is. And he said, I'm putting 50,000 down and you all turned me down. And we didn't bank with them at all. Well, all the decisions were made in Kansas City. And by the way, Raj, today's my birthday. And today would be Doug Page's birthday, who was the chief credit officer of the company. Well, well, thank you. And Doug's exactly 40 years older. So I just picked up the phone and called Doug. And he and Mickey said, one minute, Sean, because that was the advantage I had. And that's what really helped me in St. Louis was because I spent two years in Kansas City. And I'm sitting here with Charlie Drury and da, da, da. And he said, well, I'll call so-and-so in mortgage. And I said, so Mr. Drury and I spent an hour talking. And Mickey called back and said, um, hold for Doug. And I did. And Doug said, Sean, he goes, we turned him down because he's a developer. And, and we didn't do business. We only made owner occupied. We didn't do apartments. We only did owner occupied commercial real estate, you know, facilities that were, you know, manufacturing distribution, things where you know, we did a lot of business with Walmart. They occupied their space, things like that. And I told him, and for the next 25 years, anytime we'd run into each other, it always been a group of people. And Mr. Drury, who's unbelievably successful, arguably the best hotel chain in the country because they've never had one close, would always put his arm around me and say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the only banker who told me no. And uh, so that was a fun one too, but there've been some great ones. Yeah, that's awesome. So Drury, I think they're based out of, or they were founded in Cape Girardeau. 
they were. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, one of the key differentiators for them is they own all of their hotels. So you can't just get a jewelry flag. I don't believe. No, you can't. They own them all. The other thing is, and I don't know if they still do this, and I won't take you through the whole thing, but there were four or five key executives, him, his son, a man that was a very good friend of mine, a man that I knew through a club and a fifth guy I didn't know. And they would independently go to the site and then they come back because sometimes you get group think. It's like if you take your team out to an apartment complex and maybe you're lukewarm, but everybody around you is like, rah, rah, we need to do this. And their philosophy in those days was, and I don't know now, was if one person says no, it's a no. And so their sites are unbelievable. What most people don't is because of his background, they bought, unlike the normal hotel chain, they try to buy the whole corner of the interchange. So like out of 141 and 44, they bought all that land because we did the, the part where there's a retail center and there's, um, there's a Ruby Tuesdays, there's a Bob Evans. They surrounded all their stuff there. So they had really foresight. They looked at it from an ownership thing. And I think that's so important. I tell people all the time, you don't think like an owner. And especially in the real estate business, and this is a lot of business where it's commission driven, is that they only think about the commission in that transaction. But when you're an owner, you're there for a long time. And they've just been unbelievable. They have a great product and it's done nothing but get better. They've gone up market and it's a great family and a wonderful story. And by the way, Mr. Drury reminded me that day that in 1974, when my high school built an addition, he was the contractor. He had heard of Thayer, Missouri. We had a lot of laughs. <laughs> I bet it's not often that you come across people that have heard of Thayer, Missouri, you know, being such a small town. I'd never heard of it until you, you know, expanded on exactly where it is. So I'm sure being from Thayer and being an outsider in St. Louis is kind of what gave you some of the flair you have. I think, you know, you're very confident and very well-spoken. And again, I'm sure that really tied into or helped you grow Allegiant. Aside from just your sheer desire, passion, and then your ability to grow as an entrepreneur and CEO, uh, build the right team, create that culture, what else do you think led to your success with Allegiant and then the ultimate exit to National City? There, time means everything. And when I was out raising money, there's a company in town, a large company that I went in and the guy said, I asked him for money. I didn't know him. I knew the company. But a man who invested, who I mentioned in the book, sent me to a lot of his friends. And he said, Sean, he goes, what is a bright, hardworking man like you doing in the banking business? It's in a long-term cyclical decline. And he was right. The beautiful thing about it was being in an industry as a decline, there's a lot of opportunity. And we seized that opportunity. And literally about a dozen years ago, I said the opportunity is over in banking. And it is. The exit was pretty simple. 15 years of holding a group together is very, very hard. You know, the beautiful thing I had is my investors didn't, the people that had big investments like myself, they didn't need the money because you had a lot of phases where people solve that, but it's more of people just are ready to move on. And 15 years in business is a lifetime. And we had all those years of quarter over quarter increase. I mean, we were Wall Street darling because every quarter we were up double digits. And you can only do that. And what really hit me was we reached a point where most companies would have just become large, boring banks. And I said, no, it's time to sell because we couldn't grow those double digits for into the foreseeable future because you can't. There's a time where the, the law of large numbers, they work for you on the way up and they can work against you once you get up there. And most companies, and I bought so many banks along the way and so many deals, and it was always about the other guy. And they were men in those days what they got up because they had very small stock holdings. So it's, how much money could you get to them? And I was never like that. I, whenever it came, when it was the right time and I told the board it was the right time, I went out and they came to me and I said, I have a contract. I'll get whatever I get. It. I said, I'm the third largest shareholder. I get mine with the shareholder. I'm aligned with the shareholder. And I think that's so important in business that managers and even in small companies, I'm not saying give everybody stock. You can give them rights. You can give them in city plans that tie to that, but you have to have your interests aligned. And I learned that National City was a Fortune 200, and the one thing they had right was compensation. They aligned everyone's compensation to get the right goal. And I think that's what most companies don't do. And I'm very negative on public companies because they're generally enriched to management. You know, it's like an ESOP. I've dealt with so many ESOP companies, and once they pay their debt off, they're just on perpetuating the business. They don't really care if they make money. They want to perpetuate their position. And I, that's not capitalism. It's surely not entrepreneurship. 
And I believe you go out there every day. And we started off this conversation before the mics were on with effort. And I believe everybody has talent. Everybody puts out effort. And um, I have two nephews, both all American, the golfers. One won the PGA FedEx Cup. He's been rookie of the year on the PGA. And I do the tortoise and the hare. The older brother is a much better golfer. And actually at dinner a few months ago, a friend of mine asked him a question. And he said, if you look at four days of golf, Raj, I can beat Brant Thursday and Friday, but I can't do it Saturday and Sunday. It's dedication. It's resilience. And that's what makes companies successful. There's all kinds of talent. There's all kinds of effort. But at the end of the day, it's about results. And as I said, I'm a little old-fashioned, and I'm certainly old. And I know that you're older today. But the point is, we give trophies to people for showing up. We got to give trophy to the people who win the race. And that's what matters. And it's not rude or it's not demeaning. I've lost far more times than I've won. We all have. But you have to look for that in people. Did you see that shift in the business world as you were going through your entrepreneurial journey? Like, did you start off in maybe a more cutthroat environment? And then as new generations entered the workforce, did you have to think more about, I guess, um, you know, feelings and, and things like that? And and that's probably not the right way to put it, but I'm sure you... Yes. And the world is changing. I don't think, and I, and I told my son, he turned 36 last week, I said, Stephen, I said, several years ago, I said, it's not my world anymore. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being more aware, being more fit, being more inclusive. As soon as I bought my first bank in St. Louis, I had women and minorities on the board day one, you know, and we got rid of a racist day one, you know, that there's no place for things like that, but you have to have an edge. And it scares me that the edge keeps going away. And I look at very large companies and governments, and they have two things in common for their employees. You really don't have to do a lot right, but God forbid, don't do one thing wrong. And I can look at you and know you've done a lot of things wrong. But what people don't realize is you can get in the Hall of Fame in baseball for being right three out of 10 times at the plate. And so you've got to make a lot of bad decisions. You've got to make a lot of mistakes. But if you do that day in and day out, they outweigh themselves. What you can't have is a culture or a country that can't make a decision. And I always said, people would say, what's your best trait? And now then people say it's resilience and things like that. But I always said is I can make a decision. And I also know when it's wrong, I can change my own decision. I won't go to the bottom of the ocean. Once I'm down a few feet, I'm going to figure out this is not good. Let's go to plan B. And I've always said my plan A never worked. I was usually on X, Y, or Z. But no, that's the thing that scares me in, in a lot of businesses and in society is you just have to remember it's about risk and reward and doing the right thing. And you're going to be wrong a lot. I 100% agree with you. I think being able to make decisions quickly is true strength. And then being able to pivot quickly once you know you've made a wrong decision or a bad decision and then move in another direction. So the constant iteration, I think, helps a lot of companies. And because smaller companies by nature are able to pivot quicker, that's what kind of separates, you know, the disruption or the ability to scale versus larger established companies like you were mentioning. When you mention decision making, you know, making right decisions, wrong decisions, at some point you made a wrong decision that led to your ultimate, I don't want to say demise, but the downslope that kind of led to why you refer to yourself as entrepreneur, speaker, author, felon. So that felon piece, the act or the crime that you committed that led to you becoming a felon, that wasn't during your allegiant days. That was much after, correct? Correct. Much later. And what I say is, and that's why the book's a great choice, because life is very little black and white. We like, when you're young, it's black and white. I think it is when somebody's, and when you're older, you know, you, you see there's more gray. And I made a lot of choices in life that led me further out on the ground. The analogy I like to use is if you leave LA on a plane bound for DC, and if you're off by one degree, you end up in New York City because of time, speed, and distance. And that's what happened to me. But I knowingly committed a crime when I did it. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was illegal. And I justified it because you have to be able to justify it. All right. I would hope you would have to be, if you would have a con, you'd be a sociopath if you couldn't, because I didn't take money. But the decision I made was driven. And I believe most decisions are made by greed and fear. And I'd lost so much money in the, and I, I was reading an article this morning and I felt like I wrote it. What somebody believes is getting ready to happen. And what I went through 15 years ago is I caught a folly knife and I was already down and then it just made it worse. And there was a transaction I was involved with. It's very complex, but I like to go right to the point. I knew the minute that I let it happen, I committed a felony. 
But unlike robbing a 7-Eleven where, you know, they call the police and somebody's on it, it takes a while. And so I had seven years after that of having to live with it on one hand and on the other hand, eventually having to deal with it. And I really appreciate your choice of words. It wasn't my demise, but I'll come back to that. What happened to me is, and this is for your entrepreneurial listener, and I preach this morning, noon, and night. I talked about four people around me. You have to surround yourself with people who, number one, you implicitly trust and you will tell them everything. Number two, that will be blatantly blunt, honest with you. Number three, it's not your spouse, your significant other, your partner, because that's a different relationship. They have to be people. They, some should be from your industry, maybe. There should be people from left field. But I did such a good job for so long of, and, and because the economy was so bad, I didn't have the resources, or I chose not to allocate the resources, a better word, my choice, a bad choice, to surround myself with people who knew what I didn't know or who were better at things I wasn't as good at. And that is so important. In so I was building that, I did that day in and day out. And then that's one. The group of people, and I, I tell people, buy them lunch, do this, do something so they feel value. If you're big enough, make it economically valuable. There's people who want to help you. They have all that knowledge. Like those 30 CEOs I were with, I know a lot of them do pro bono advising because they don't need the money. And they're big St. Louis names and, um, and some great names of some unbelievable companies. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is know what you don't know. That's important. And then as you go down that path, you have to remember most entrepreneurs make their money on what I call being a guerrilla warrior. And there's a great book called Guerrilla Marketing. And um, my fireworks stand, one reason I was successful is I took two four by eight sheets of plywood and wrote discount fireworks ahead and went about a mile down the road to the neighbors. They would put up their fence and a mile north and did that. The other thing was, this was called a mimeograph machine. No one listening knows what this is. It's what you call a copier today. I went to the school, got to use a mimeograph machine, and I had discount fireworks, bottle rockets, 99 cents a gross, and I would go to grocery stores and put them in the windshield on the wipers of cars. That's guerrilla marketing. But business is guerrilla warfare, small business. And I did that for so long, and then I spent four years with a Fortune 200, and I lost all touch with reality and you're so siloed that I didn't understand what had happened in the market. I came back, did what I thought would do to bail me out of a bad situation, caught the falling knife, made a horrible decision, committed a crime, then had to live with it, and then had to serve 37 months in federal prison, which if you have me back again, I'll tell you about that because it tells you how broken the system is. It's sad. It's sad from there's no rehabilitation for people. There's really no support. It's a system that's there to perpetuate itself. And by the way, I never met one man, because you don't incarcerate men, who didn't say they weren't guilty. So all that stuff where people say, I wasn't guilty, that's BS. That wasn't there. But what's amazing is how that is nothing's done there to keep, and that's why 70% of people go back. There's nothing there. It's a government program built on perpetuating a government program. But but no, I made I made that mistake. I committed a crime. I paid for that crime in more ways you can. It cost me freedom, obviously. I have a broken relationship with my family. It cost me a ton of money financially. And it cost me a lot of friends. What you do learn that that is, is who your friends really are. And this is one thing about this town. It may be punishing in one regard to people. It's also very welcoming in other. And it's just been unbelievably surprising about that. And I like to say this. There's a saying in the world. Seldom in life does someone realize their greatest dreams or their worst fears. I've realized way above my greatest dreams. I've been fortunate to not reach my worst fear, which would be losing a child, but I've been there. And that gives me such a perspective. And I believe, and people say this, everyone has a book in them. And if you went back to Thayer, Missouri, and went to, granted, anybody went to school with me, I would have probably been least likely to ever write anything because I did not like English. I love mathematics and sports. But an, a friend of 40 years and a friend of three years, an African-American man, both read the book, both called me up, said, let's break bread. And they both said the same thing. They said, do you not feel free? And I said, you know what's funny is, and I looked at Anthony and, I, and he's taking me off my birth today, a 48-year-old, unbelievable African-American entrepreneur. I love his story, makes money every day, thinks like you and I do. And it tells you entrepreneurship is not about race. It's about people. 
And he said, don't you feel free? And I said, Anthony, I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. And I'm out having fun and doing deals and making money. And I have a great perspective. And I get to meet people like you in business and in situations like this. And I love what you are doing. And it's really, I have to say, your generation. You take this median, a media of podcasting, and you share it. And people don't realize you don't need to watch TV. Whether you exercise, you drive, listen to all the knowledge is out there. And all, and I'm not talking about just business knowledge, health knowledge, exercise, all these things you can learn for nothing in almost every case from really experienced people. And that's what your free time should be about. And uh, so this has been great. There's one thing that I wrote a note on that I wanted to get back to. You mentioned 83 investors for the first bank, and it perfectly ties into what you just said. It was a lot harder back then to get access to information. And then, of course, access to people as well. You couldn't just send an email to 100 people. So how did you go about finding those 83 investors? Was it all word of mouth? Well, it was a lot of people I'd met. In virtual, I said less than five years. I'd been in St. Louis five years. So it was people I'd done business with. But I have to tell you a funny story. There was one man who helped me. He was an insurance man. And he was older and, and didn't have, he was a modest means. So I didn't expect him to invest. But he introduced me to the guy, Dick Gastorf, who was the CEO who grew McBride and Son for 20 some years. And he invested like that in, 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 in people. So somebody, he said, I've got a young man, we'll call him John Smith. And we went to Hilton Frontenac. And in those days at breakfast, it was bustling. We got the front table and he said, be there. The guy's going to be there at 7.30. So I got there about 7.20. He had been there before and we're ready. And so you walk in and he gets up and he goes, are you John Smith? And I go, very quick, I forgot. He didn't know John Smith. Well, about 8.45, John Smith walked in. And so I had so many of those kind of things. I had one man who was on TV every day then and every day for a lot of years afterwards who I met with six times. And every time he goes, I want to give you a check the next time I meet. He never, never did, which is fine. I don't hold any malice. But what was great was his grandson ended up being in class with one of my grandsons, one of my sons. And he said, you know, the biggest mistake I ever made was not giving you that check. But it was wonderful. And I think raising capital is such an experience that, and I'm involved with some people right now, but I know personally they're out doing it. And I, and the son calls me all the time and he goes, boy, this is hard on one hand, easy on the other but it teaches you so much about people, business, and life. And I think that's, that's something that you need. I also think it's a lot easier. You can crowdfund now. There's all kinds of things out there that weren't there 34 years ago. But I think the experience of raising capital is a key component of being a good entrepreneur because it teaches you the value of capital. And um, it also teaches you communication. Because if you take someone's money and you communicate results, good or bad, consistently, they're going to be with you through thick and thin. And after the first bank, you don't know this. No one really knows this because we didn't speak a lot of it. We were public. We went public on September 29th, 1995. Most companies go public through an offering. Do you know until almost eight years later, we never sold a share of common to the public? We did. It was 17 a quarter a share, 17 and a half. And we sold that for 27 and a quarter, seven months later. If we know we were going to sell we wouldn't have done the offering because obviously not that we didn't want those people make $10 a share, but it diluted us. The point was, and this is what people don't understand is we went public with $40,000 of legal fees for SEC filings and, and SEC costs. Stiefel Nicholas in town and, and Paul and company small, you had to have two brokers that qualifies as the NASDAQ, two market makers. And the reason why we had 400 shareholders were all the offerings I'd done. But those 83 people, when I went and raised money for the second bank, it was sold out as soon as I called people. We did that about five times. That got us over 400 shareholders. So that's why I tell entrepreneurs, when you go get money, be stingy. And I have a whole talk about that that I give anybody you want for free. But be stingy with that capital. But once you get it, if you give them information results, then it just grows like a wildfire. It's unbelievable. And that's what makes this country great is the flow of capital to entrepreneurs. Just two quick questions now uh, before we wrap it up. You mentioned that it was after Allegiant that you made the decision that ultimately led to you going to prison. Can you expand on what that decision was? Was your back against the wall at the time? I was losing millions of dollars a week and month. And um, I had done a transaction myself and for other people buying debt, buying distressed debt. And one of the banks that I own 54% of, that's a key part of this story, 
had a chance to buy $16 million of real estate debt for seven. And I'd watched the guy do it this way. I had done it in small chunks. And it was hundreds of properties and notes. There was from three different banks. And one of the properties and notes, one of the banks had all these notes with a guy who I was in one of the partnerships with, but our loan was performing. But to buy the bad debt, we had to take the good debt. Now, here's what's wrong with that. And I knew it was a crime. In this country, if you own more than 10%, you really can't do business with yourself in a bank. At 54%, it's forget a banking law is a federal crime, which I committed. And But to get it done, driven by the fear of my failure that I'm going through and the greed of seeing the money at the other end, that's what I did. And then not only that, um, so that was the first crime, as I pleaded guilty to two. The second part of the crime was the guy in the middle just did nothing. I had watched him hundreds and hundreds of times successfully do this, and his problems were he was so overwhelmed. In fact, a man took me to lunch last week that I'd never met before who'd read the book, and he said, I just wanted to meet you. He goes, the man that you were involved with, a guy called me up, this was years later, after the crime, and said, you know, we have three real estate contracts here where you're buying these buildings. And he said, what buildings? I haven't bought a building since like 07. It's like 15. And he said, no, he goes, you signed them and the broker so-and-so. And And he was still out committing crimes then. And um, I long moved on after that, but I did it was wrong. And of course, it takes a long time to blow up in your face. And that's why the little decisions are always important. And it's never worth taking a half inch into the black because you're going to pay. And, um, you know, it it defines me to this day. The good news is I feel like every day I get a little bit more redemption and I have a ton of fun every day. But uh, it was a a transaction that um, I just should not have done. What's your hole in one? That's the way we're ending every single show. Our hole in one is just your top tip for someone listening or watching today that they can implement into their life or business to improve their situation? It's a simple, to me, I love logo, mission statements, things like that. Not for the reason why you have them, but I think Nike's the best. Just do it. There's so many people, Raj, who are getting ready to get ready. They either want to jump in to be an entrepreneur and they don't want to, they don't ever do it. Or they're out there in their business and they just won't take that next step. And you have to be willing to fail failure. And I had to go through what I had to go through this because I feared failure. And in my mind, I had a failure. And then I figured out it isn't failure. You quit. So you've got, you got to take a measured risk, but you've got to do it. Cause so many people, there was a study 30 years ago, exactly. That came out. It was about octogenarians, which was, and probably still is the fastest growing segment of the population because you know not that many of them on a percentage basis, but they asked him a series of questions. But the one that just got me was they over 80% of them said, they would have taken more risk. And you don't get to that next level by not taking risk. And by the way, you, you've got video here, but for those of you who don't have video, we all think of driving results northeast. But northeast isn't a linear line. It's like this. You're up and you're down and you're up and you're down. But you get there. You have to take those risks. So just the hole in one is just do it. I appreciate that. And that lines up with a lot of uh, other entrepreneurs and the advice they've given. It seems to be a recurring theme of just do it. Uh, where can listeners or viewers learn b- more about you, your book, your story? It's uh, seanhays.com. And I like to joke, I spell Sean right, S-H-A-U-N. And I have uh, YouTubes out there that are a lot of snippets about things we didn't cover that I think that people would enjoy just based on experience. Sean, thank you for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Raj. I really enjoyed it. If you're a high quality company interested in reaching the high performing audience of Country Club Conversations, let's see how we can work together. To explore sponsorship opportunities, email advertising at storyboardliving.com. That's advertising at storyboardliving.com.